morning, everyone, and welcome to Mind Speak. Real pleasure today to host a dear friend, Kebrono Kitoni. Um, and let me just give you a, a short introduction. Consummate business leader, a man of many hats. Um, currently serves as the national chairman of the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce. Widely credited for its revival, and it really was in a desperate place before Kip came along. Also the founder chairman of the Radio Africa Group, which is KISS, The Star, MTech Limited, AAR Insurance Limited, Serwo Group. He has also served as the chair of Media Owners Association and sat on several boards. Mr. Kitone is also CEO of Capital Airtime Limited, a leading Safaricom dealer, and sits on the advisory council of IFHA, the International Fund for Health in Africa, an Amsterdam-based private equity fund, and is one of two representatives in the Global Council in the World Chambers Federation in Paris. A successful businessman in his own right, Mr. Kitoni is a passionate farmer, growing coffee, tea, purple tea as well, macadamia nuts, which I learned is a is an aphrodisiac in, in uh, China, <laughs> and that's what Kips is betting on, <laughs> as well as running an enviable dairy herd in Kitali. Married to Rosemary, with whom they have four beautiful daughters, he maintains an enviable fitness regime. And Kip, what is your time on your, on your you're running 10 kilometers, right? Yeah. Or? Married to Rosemary, with whom they have four beautiful daughters, and he likes to running and an occasional game of golf. So it's a real pleasure to have Kiprono here. We've been friends a long, long time. Kiprono's got his finger on the pulse. He knows what's happening. A real entrepreneur, someone I admire. And uh, interestingly, also a great reader of the stock market as well. And uh, I remember a while back when, when we were talking about it and you called it then and he can call a lot of things. So really a very great pleasure. I think Kiprono is one of uh, my favorite people and uh, I, it's a real pleasure to have him here today. Kiprono, the floor is yours. Thank you. Wow, Ali Khan. <laughs> what an introduction, huh? So let me start uh, by saying what an honor and a privilege it is here to be here at MindSpeak today. Uh, we've spoken about this uh, many times with Ali Khan, and um, we've actually planned it on a few occasions, but because of my travel regime, it's been impossible to do it. But uh, when he asked me two weeks ago and said, can we do it on the 28th? And I said, let's do it. And Ali Khan, it's such an honor and a privilege to be here uh, this morning. Let me start by saying um, I very often make presentations uh, about what the work that I do in the chamber. Um, about three or four times a year, I go back to university and give motivational uh, talks, but rarely do I have to speak about myself. So when I was asked to make this presentation, it was a bit of a challenge because I didn't know what to say about myself vis-a-vis uh, -vis what I have to say about the work that I do. But let me use this 30 minutes that I've been given to debunk a few uh, notions about myself and who I am, the things that I enjoy to do, the thoughts that I have about where we are today and where we should be, where, where I think we will be tomorrow. Uh, let me start by looking inwards and talk about myself uh, briefly. I was born in March of 1965. My father, Paul, was a manager with the tea estates in Kericho. He's one of the early people to enter the tea industry as a manager with KTDA. And my mother, Zipporah, who is a very well-known person in Kenya, was a social worker. She worked for Family Health, uh, fa uh, Family Planning International. And because she worked for Family Planning, our family only has three. My father had two sons and, my, and, a, and, a, and a daughter. So we grew up in a very small family. Most of the other families that we related with had seven or eight siblings. And I always thought how lucky they were to have so many brothers and sisters. I only had one brother and one sister. And it's because my mother worked for family planning, so I'm sure she had many pills in the house. <laughs> and um, I'm married to Rosemary. Uh, my wife Rosemary works with me in Capital Real Time. She's a director of my company. And we are blessed with four uh, daughters. Uh, the eldest daughter, Chanel, in university in Portsmouth in England. Our sister, Catherine, in University of Edinburgh studying law. 
and I have two uh, younger daughters, Chantal in Peponi and uh, Angel in Kenton. And Angel and uh, Ali Khan's, uh, actually my daughters and Ali Khan's daughters uh, have shared schools for a long time, so that's why we have become um, good friends in the course of time. So in a nutshell, that's who we are in terms of family. And um, what do I do at the moment? Um, currently, I, am the, I, the, the, I spend 90% of my time as the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and I'll speak a bit more about that later. I'm also CEO of Capital Real Time, and Capital Real Time is actually the second largest safaricom dealership in Kenya. We have 48 shops uh, across the country. We have 250 staff, and uh, we, we do about 5% of safaricom's airtime through our own outlets. I'm also the founder chairman of uh, the Radio Africa Group, um, together with Patrick Kwaku, we founded Radio Africa in 2000 and um, it has since, um, we started off with just KISS FM and I think for those of you who were around and I think not many of you were of age at that time but I remember, you know, that was an exciting moment in my life because uh, Kwaku came to town with some very, very interesting ads and I remember for the first time I was actually advised to disappear because the president was so upset with the ads that he was <laughs> going to shut the station down so I had to switch my phone off and disappear for a few days. <laughs> I'm also chairman of uh, my jobs in Kenya, which is an online job portal, um, AAR Health Insurance, where I represent uh, the interest of International Fund for Health in Africa. I'm also chairman of MTech Communications, which is a value-added service provider. Um, I bought into that company um, five, four years ago, and we've since grown it. It's in 10 countries in Africa, and I think in Kenya now we are the second largest, uh, second biggest uh, value-added service provider in the country. It's an exciting business because the average age of our staff in MTech is 23. Um, they're very, very young, very innovative. We, we create uh, content for the mobile phone platforms. And right now, we've just signed on agency for a technology called Nuance, which is a, a biometric voice recognition technology. And I think we'll be the first to deploy that in Kenya. And we, are we will be running a pilot with Safaricom in January. I think that's going to be a big, big moment because uh, what's going to happen now is when you call into a, the Safaricom network, it'll be like calling into Barclays uh, switchboard overseas. You won't get a human voice interface. You'll get a, uh, you'll get a, a computer uh, voice response. And the computer actually knows, it adapts itself and learns uh, languages. And every human voice has actually got a unique signature. So we will be actually deploying um, a technology that will actually avoid you being asked all the questions you're asked, so what's your PIN number, what's your date of birth, it, just by virtue of the signature, the unique uh, signature in your voice, you'll be able to deploy a technology that will cut through several phases of uh, verification. Uh, International Fund for Health in Africa, I'm on the Global Advisory Council. This is a fund, uh, it's a 200 million euro fund that invests in healthcare in Africa, and this company owns, am amongst others, the AR Group in Kenya. It has healthcare companies and insurance companies across Africa, all focused on providing health in this uh, region. And the World Chambers Federation, because of the work that I've done with the Chamber of Commerce in Kenya, um, I am now on the Global Council. I'm one of two people representing Africa on that council. We sit in Paris and we have about four meetings every year to discuss uh, the matters around the Chamber movement uh, globally. Now, Educationally, um, I, I did uh, my Bachelor of Commerce degree in 1988. And that's interesting because uh, actually my intention was to do study law. So because I was so active in student leadership in, my, in high school in Lenana, um, I, I missed the qualifying point to do law by one, one point. At that time, to, you had to get 14 A-level points to study law, and I had 13. So I felt really bad about it and I applied to university in Canada, but my parents didn't have the money. And that's one thing that I also want to talk about because my, my mother is a very prominent politician. The perception is that I probably grew up from in a wealthy family that we had everything at our disposal. And the reality is that we didn't actually. We were just an average middle class family working its way up. So I thought I'd go to university in Canada. I applied and I got uh, accepted in York University, but my parents didn't have the money. So I was stuck to going to University of Nairobi to study commerce. I was really pissed off because my dad was so happy. And <laughs> he said, in fact, I'm so happy you didn't get that one point because I don't want any lawyers in my house. I think you're a good businessman and, you, and this is what you're going to do. Well, what I did is I went back to the university in 2001 to study law because I so, want, so much wanted to study law. And when I was in the university, I was part of the ISEC program. So any of you here coming from the universities studying anything in the humanities, 
I strongly recommend that you join the ISEC program. It gave me such a, an advantage in my life because I was so exposed as a young man. By the time I was finishing my third year, I was exchange controller. We grew the program significantly. By the time I finished my third year, I had traveled to about seven or eight countries. So I had become a citizen of the world by the time I left university simply because of the ISEC uh, uh, program. The, I did my law degree in 2005, and one of the reasons that motivated me to study law is because the English common law operates on the presumption of universal knowledge. We live in, in a jurisdiction that is covered by the English common law, so the law presumes that you know every statute in the book. So if you, break a, if you, if you commit a crime, the law actually presumes that you knew that was a statute. And I don't know how many of you know how many statutes there are in Kenya, but there are very, very many interesting statutes, including the dog uh, the ordinance of Nairobi 1958 that says if your dog <coughs> barks and causes a nuisance, you're eligible to a fine. I mentioned to Governor Kidero recently that the dog ordinance of 1958 has never been repealed. So if you have a dog and it barks at night and causes a nuisance, you can actually be fined and even jailed. So I, I actually really wanted to study law because I thought rather than be in the dark, Let's let me just get in there, study it, and know what's going on. Um, in 2008, I went to Strathmore University, and I did a, got an owner management uh, o OMP certificate. That's an owner management course. And uh, that was in conjunction with the La uh, Lagos Business School. So we also spent a bit of time in Lagos. And in 2012, um, I, I, I graduated with a global executive MBA from USIU. And um, was, it was an exciting course, and I was actually um, I think I did quite well in that uh, particular course. Now, what did I do after university? I was so good in the ISEC program, I actually used to uh, coach fellow university students on presentation skills. I used to spend weekends helping my colleagues making their CVs and presenting themselves and actually teaching them how to, to speak in public. And um, because of that, I was very self-confident and I think but because of the travel, my BCom degree was a lower honours. So I made an application to 12 companies, and as fate would have it, I received 10 letters of appointment. I did 12 interviews, and I had 10 letters of em 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 employment. Kenya Airways, Central Bank, KCB, all of them. I had a lower honours degree, and every time I went for an interview, the, the, lecture, I mean the interviewers would ask me, so why, do you, why is your BCom a, a lower honours? And I said to them, because I travel. And they'd ask me, where have you traveled? And I'd tell them, I've been to Spain, I've been to Norway, I've been to New York, I've been to Boston, I've been to London, I've been to Denmark, I've been to <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> so I guess I created a compelling case to be employed. So here I was, young man at 23, with 10 letters of employment. So what did I do? I got into a bus, and, um, a Kamba bus, and I went to Kitala, and I gave my CVs to my dad, one of my letters of employment. So I gave him 10 letters of employment on a Friday night, and I said, I'm going to have fun with my friends. Uh, I'd like your advice on Monday about the job that I should take. <laughs> so my dad took all of the letters and uh, spent the weekend going through them. And on Monday morning, I had breakfast with him, and I said, Dad, so what's the deal? So I thought he was going to ask me to either join the Central Bank or KCB. Or I really wanted to go to Kenya Airways because I thought that was exciting. And um, he said, no, you're going to go to UTC, United Touring Company. So I asked him, why? He said, it's got the lowest salary. So he got all the CVs. Uh, I think Central Bank was starting at 25,000. Uh, Kenya Airways was 18,000. So he said, this one, UTC, that's going to pay you 6,000 is the way you're going to go. I asked him, why? Then he said, so you can learn how to work hard. You need, you need to be really, really broke so you can be, work really, really hard. <laughs> So I took this job where I was earning 6,000 bob. Uh, my girlfriend in campus then uh, was appointed to work as a, uh, in the sales department at NCR Computer, and she was earning 30,000 bob. And with her commission, she was making like 50,000 bob a month. So within the first three months of our getting into employment, she booted me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's me. <laughs> because every time we went out, she'd have to pick the tab. And in front of me is my first paycheck, that's uh, 6,000 bob a month, and that's what I earned for a while. But I'll tell you something else that was a bit more interesting than that. Huh? 
Now, when I was in school, I was helping the family in the business. My dad had two old trucks, uh, Bedfords. I don't know how many of you know what a Bedford truck is. And I used to, I learned how to drive by driving a Bedford truck. And the truck that I was actually driving had a gear that would get off. So somebody had to hold the gear down. And so we carried yellow maize in 85 uh, to the relief uh, places in West Pocot. I was a driver and I had a turn boy and it was interesting and I learned how to drive. I was also on the farm, uh, tending to our farm that we had in Kitale. In 85, I joined the National Youth Service. I don't know why somebody put dreaded. It was actually NYS. It was a fantastic experience. It was one of the best in the world. And if there's one thing that I'd like to recommend to the leadership of this country, we need the NYS back. Yeah. And especially for the youth who grew up in the cities, who don't know what it is like to live in the rural areas, who don't know what it is like to be woken up at 5 o'clock and be forced to jog 10 kilometers, who don't know what it is like to wash your clothes and hang them out and dry them and iron them and make sure your shoes are shining to the extent that you can see your face. I think NYS was fantastic. And it's one of the things that I would like to recommend as we move forward in this country. I joined ISEC, like I said to you earlier, and I traveled the world. Now, one of the things that I did after I left uh, high school, uh, when, when, when I left high school in 83, when I was waiting to join the university because we had a two-year wait, um, I started my first business, which was Kitale Video Services. And how did I start this business? The, at that time, there was the Turkwell Gorge project that was uh, deploying a hydro project in West Pocot. And a French company called Spie Batignon was contracted to come and, and, and build that. And um, one of the Frenchmen walked into the shop. My father had a sports shop in Kitale. And he said to me, we're so bored in West Pocot. Do you know where we can get video cassettes? And I said, um, I said Let, I'll give you an answer in an hour. So I went and I thought about it. And then now I met him. And I said to him, yeah, I can get you video cassettes. And um, I'd made a few phone calls to Nairobi, and I knew I could get video cassettes for 20 shillings per day. That was the going rate per cassette. So he said, look, I'd like 20 cassettes, video cassettes, supplied to me every week. And I said, perfect. I got into a bus, and I came to Nairobi, and I met a gentleman called Amin Walji. Amin Walji later became Member of Parliament for Westlands. He had a big video library called Ideal Video in Westlands. And I said to him, I have this opportunity in Turkwell, I must supply 10 videos um, per day, I mean every single week to these guys in Turkwa. And the, to, to carry these videos to Kitale by, by bus, it would take two days going and two days back. So I said to him, I need two weeks. Every time I took 10 videos from him, he gave me two weeks. And he said, fine, I'll charge you two, 20 bob per cassette for two weeks. So I was paying Amin Walji 200 bob for 10 videos that I'd take to Kitale, it cost me about 50 shillings to, to take them on uh, overnight courier, uh, two ways, so I was, I, was, I was spending 300 bob, but the French were paying me 200 shillings per day. Do you get this, the arithmetic? Mm. Yeah. So when they went and did the market survey, true enough, they were told, yeah, it's 20 bob per day. So they were very happy, they had this deal, and I did that for three years. So I had, um, so they increased the order to 40, 30 to 40, so I was charging, per day, but they were paying me, I was paying Amin Walji per week. So basically I was able to build some capital out of that. So every month throughout my time in university I was making a profit of 10,000 bob. But I wasn't taking this profit because I was building the library. So by the end of three years I had 3,000 of my own cassettes. And we became the largest video library before I, I, I finished my third year. By the time I was leaving for Europe, uh, after I got my job in UTC, I had 3,000 cassettes and I was making about 20 or 30,000 bob. So even, even though my girlfriend booted me because I didn't have money, I was actually building a business. So I joined UTC and uh, there was four management trainees and they said the best of us would go and work in the London office. I, I, I managed to, be, to make that cut and I went and worked in London for two years and uh, it was a good eye-opening experience because I, I got the experience of working um, in a foreign country. Uh, I didn't stay long. When I came back from London in 91, um, I just felt that I had to do business. And I think my father was spot on that I was, a business, I was cut out to be a businessman. I had made some contacts in Europe, so I formed a company called Fresh Produce, which was a horticultural company. I then went to Mumias and negotiated for a transport contract. And, they, and I formed a company called Versatrans. I bought five trucks using a loan from KCB. Um, and then I also got into beer distribution. 
And I formed a holding company and I said, one day I'll, hold, I'll, I'll, I'll own several shares in several companies. So I formed a family holding company. I actually formed that company in 1989, which was even long before I got into any serious business. All these companies were financed by KCB and um, we did quite well. And I mean, in the early 90s, um, business was thriving. I was really the man about town. And it was one really exciting time in town because I had so many friends. Everyone would talk to me. This is this young guy, uh, um, bright young guy who's traveled the world. Now suddenly he's got all these little businesses. But I didn't tell people that these businesses have been financed by KCB. So like many people, I went through the school of hard knocks. One after the other, my companies collapsed. My company, Fresh Produce, uh, we supplied um, about 20,000 cartons of uh, French beans to Ranges Market in Paris. And the guy who was buying it, his name was Michel Legros. He closed down <laughs> and opened in a different name. I hadn't known those tricks. So suddenly he had a new company and he, was, he had new suppliers in Kenya. He owed me cash, but he couldn't pay me. KCB didn't want to know. So they, they came in, um, seized my, my warehouse in the industrial area, sold my coal stores, seized my trucks, sold them. And one Saturday morning, they came in and shut down my office. So in 1994, I got married. And as soon, as I, after, soon after my wedding, as soon as I finished my, my honeymoon, I realized I was flat broke. And it was sad because my wife knew she was marrying this upcoming, promising <laughs> <laughs> businessman. And I had to explain to her that uh, the Mercedes I had, uh, had to sell it because I had to pay some creditors. Some of the farmers who had taken their produce in were. And I suddenly had to start driving an old beat up 504. And I had no office. In the whole of 1995, I had no office. I was. Um, one of my partners in two of the companies was a very prominent Kenyan at that time. And obviously, you know, because I had, you know, I had gone broke, no one wanted to know about this. And whilst I was broke, I kept dealing with debt collectors. They were always coming to my house, my office, looking for their money. So I was paying them. Any little money I got, I'd pay them. And I realized maybe getting into debt collection isn't such a bad idea. So I formed a company. <laughs> I formed a company called Vanguard Credit Management. Because <laughs> I had known the tricks. I mean, you'd wake up in the morning and damn, there's a debt collector on your door. <laughs> so we got the contract with the city council and we, became, we got into debt collection business. And my grandmother, who was one of the founders of the Africa Inland Church, one day called me. The only company of mine that didn't go under during that episode was Rift Valley Outlets, which was a beer distribution. So basically, I was relying off this beer distribution business in Rift Valley. And um, my grandmother one day called me and said, young man, what business do you do? So I tried to explain to her. I said, I have a contract with the city council, and when people don't pay their rates, um, I, we go and collect the rates, we meet with the team. And she said, yeah, what else do you do? I said, I have some lorries, and they carry crates. And <laughs> <laughs> crates with what? Soda. She knew exactly what she was leading to. And I, and I said, no, beer. She said, I want you out of those two businesses. And she wasn't joking. Huh? So I had to start to think of how I was going to get out of those businesses. The hardest one was a credit management company because now I had contracts with Caltex. I had contracts with Kenya Power. I had contracts with Nairobi City Council. We, we, we started to, things weren't too bad. I, even the debtors, from the, you know, the farmers who had taken their produce and the old KCB debts, I serviced all of them. So by 1998, I was more or less through with my debt. In 97, thinking I'd get out of this trouble, I ran for elected office. So the last cash I had in the bank, I, I used it up in an election. And two days before the election, President Moore came and said, no, nobody's opposing uh, Kiputo Kirwa, who I was running against. He said, you must step down on the spot. So I'd spent all my cash, and I had to step down. <laughs> and in those days, I don't think you young guys probably weren't there, but if the president came to your county and said, this is what you're going to do, your only answer was yes, sir. So the little cash I had, I'd spent, so I was still broke, but then now these companies were helping me sort of make my way out of it. In 1999, I had gotten into defense procurement, and um, at that time, Safaricom was launching, and I told you I was a trainer in presentation skills, so I went to a gentleman called Hugh Herschel, 
I made a presentation to him about how I think I could be a great distributor for Safaricom. So we formed um, Cellular Service Logistics, which later became Capital Airtime. All the companies that I got into was through my holding company, Silver, which I had formed in 89. We got into a joint venture to form Kiss and Classic. And I made some good contracts in defense, and we were, I sort of went over the hill. I now knew that we were back in business. One of the most interesting things that I learned when I was broke is not to fear failure. Not to fear failure. It is the flip side of the coin of failure. The other thing that I realized is when you're, in a, when you're successful, not everybody who smiles at you and talks to you is your friend. Because when I was doing well in the early 90s, I had the best cars in town and we went round and people we were having a good time and you know, I was well known. Everyone who wanted to get married used to come and borrow my cars and etc. <laughs> the guys who borrowed my car to get married in weren't talking to me when I was broke. They'd see me in town and they'd cross the road. So one of the realizations is success and, and failure are two sides of a coin. Success is the flip side of the coin of, 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 of failure. And failure is the flip side of the coin of success. So I really came to appreciate that when you, you'd rather have fewer friends, you'd rather be in, in, you know, close to fewer people than have very many friends. And you see, when you're, every rich man has got as many friends as they want to have. People want to be associated with you when you're successful. So by the time now I was getting up and crossing, get going over the hill, I think I was the wiser for it. And I also learned to appreciate that it's very important to have a good and solid family behind you. During the time that I had challenges, the people who always stand closest to you are your family. And that also gives you the quality of the woman that you will marry. I mean, my wife never, at the time that we had difficulties, changed her attitude towards me. We went through really harrowing times when my first daughter was in nursery school. But by 2000, we were over the hill, new set of businesses, and we were now consolidating our gains. Capital Airtime went on to become a top 100 company with um, 35 branches. We today have a turnover of over 200 million shillings per month. We are always amongst the top 10 Safaricom dealers. Um, I also became a farmer, and this is one of the things that I would like to do when I retire. I grow coffee, um, I grow macadamia, I grow tea. Um, I love my farm. In fact, I'm even building a resort there, and it's one of the things, actually of all the things that I do, the one that I enjoy most is farming. And uh, Ali Khan sometimes calls me on weekends and I tell him I'm, st I'm, in, I'm in my cows. I don't know that it's because I'm a Kalenjin, but I just do love being on the farm and doing things that are in touch with nature. So um, um, I have a 300 acre farm in Kitale. And last year we were actually com uh, awarded the, the best large scale farm in that county. And we employ about 100 people. And I'm taking the value chain approach. What we are trying to do is not to sell commoditized products. We'd like to package our milk. We'd like to get macadamia nuts and put it in our own packaging. We have greenhouses, tomatoes, we're creating our own brands. We have a tented camp, luxury tented, luxury tented camp that we are opening in December, and a restaurant, and we would like to achieve an 80% local content ratio. Basically what that means is if you come to the restaurant on our farm, the, the flour that you'll eat in the Ugali will be from the farm, the milk will be from the farm, the chicken will be from the farm, the beef will be from the farm, the, all the ingredients will be from the farm, the coffee, we'll even have a coffee tasting facility, the tea will all be homegrown. So we are trying to do something that's quite different in terms of creating value chain, a value chain approach. So we actually take ready products to the market as opposed to selling them uh, uh, whole. So it's something I'm passionate about. Do I make money in it? No. I'll probably make money in the future. I, I, my farm is fully subsidized by my other businesses. <coughs> But I do it for the love because it's something I very, very passionately enjoy. Now, in, 19, in the year 2005, um, the bug to get into leadership was still with me. And <coughs> I was really thinking that I should run for elected office again. But my wife was so against it because of what had happened in 97. So I decided to take an interest in the Chamber of Commerce. And in, from 2006, we were going around trying to take this institution that had really been run down. The properties had been looted. It was no longer giving a service to its people. And I started the journey to lead the chamber in 2006. And we didn't succeed until March of 2012, after several court cases, um, very many harrowing experiences that we had in the hands of the old leadership of the chamber. And um, in 2012, I got into the chamber. And like everything else that I do in my life, 
I put my all in it. In fact, today I spend 90% of my time running the Chamber of Commerce. It's a highly involving job and I earn no salary for it. I do it for the love of my country and I do it because I believe it's an institution that should really be at the centre of what the private sector should do. We've been very actively involved in economic diplomacy. We've had several trips um, around the world, uh, both with His Excellency the President accompanying him on state visits, as well as missions that we as a chamber ourselves organise. Uh, the chamber was relaunched in 2014, in July. Um, I think it was 2013, actually, not 2014. We, we've had several high-level meetings, and I think it's been a unique privilege that I've had the opportunity to lead this organization during this very important time. Since we got in, we've been able to, you know, change. I, I, I got donor funding and we were able to restructure the organization. We moved offices. We were able to get support from corporate Kenya. We have uh, 28 patron members, including Ali Khan Sachu, Safaricom, Equity Bank, and all of these patron members uh, give us a, a minimum of a million shillings per year in subscription. And we've been able to really make this a very vibrant institution that represents the private sector. So what does the Chamber do? The Chamber is involved in promoting the rights of the private sector. The Chamber is involved in the issuance of certificates of origin as part of the WTO World Trade Organization protocol. The Chamber is involved in advocacy and in networking. We provide the platform for the uh, linkages between business and business and between business and government. It's an exciting organization to be a part of because the Chamber movement has started, was started in Marseille in France in the year 1599. So contrary to what a lot of people think, Chambers are actually a global movement and it, they exist in 177 countries in all the five continents. It's an old institution, it's a networked institution and it's an influential institution. I don't even know if you know, but to become President of the United States, you must go and make a presentation to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And for those of you who have been to Washington, D.C., um, the, Chamber of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is actually directly opposite the White House. So the President has to go there and make a presentation to the private sector and convince, him, convince them that they are worthy of leading that great country. So our economic diplomacy work has given me the unique privilege of meeting some of the world's uh, leaders um, I met the Sheikh of Qatar, met President Kagame, President Museveni, the President of China. I think um, on speed dial on my phone, I must have 10 heads of state numbers. <laughs> Do I dial them? No, not, not unless I have to. But it's be basically been a very unique privilege to be able to lead this organization during this very important time um, in its history. Some of the photographs are there in front of you. And we are also now moving to the counties. We are trying to consolidate the gains of what we've done with the Chamber at the National Office by taking it to the counties. A unique feature of the Chamber is that it exists in all the 47 counties of this country. So we have signed a memorandum of understanding with the Council of Governors, and you can see me there with Governor Munya. We are now helping the counties organize trade and investment um, conferences across the country. We've been in Baringo, we've been in uh, North Rift recently, we've been to Meru, We've been to Kisumu, we are going to Masai Mara uh, next uh, week on the 3rd, and we really want to ignite the chamber movement at the grassroots level. <coughs> now, why am I so passionate about it? I'm passionate because I think that not enough is being said for business in Kenya, particularly the SMEs. There's so much opportunity out there for the SMEs. There's a lot of funding. I mean, when I started business in the early 90s, it was very difficult to raise funds. But today, there's so much funding that's available in the banks. Look at the balance sheet of KCB. Look at the balance sheet of, of Barclays Bank, Equity Bank. The opportunities are just amazing. And I don't think enough is being done to really stimulate that business growth right from the grassroots level. And at the same time, if we look at the trade that takes place in Africa, the intra-African trade situation, intra-Africa trade is only at 11%. That means trade between African countries and fellow African countries. Intra-European trade in the EU is at 64%. So I've always said it, and it could be a bit of a controversial thing to say, but I think there was a colonial conspiracy to make sure Africans don't do business with Africa. What good reason is there for a container to take 10 days from Cape Town to Mombasa when it takes 18 days from um, Felixstowe in London, in England, to Mombasa? 
the linkages infrastructure wise are not, uh, not don't exist that is why if you go to Bra if you go to the DRC you'll find chicken from Brazil that is why when you go to Lagos in Nigeria many of you here I know have been to Lagos you find butter from New Zealand those are all opportunities for us and I think one of the great things that our president has done is really taken the African trade agenda seriously. As a country, we've signed <coughs> a special status agreement with Ethiopia, with a population of 90 million people. We have good trade arrangements within the East African community. And the tripartite agreement that brings together 25 countries in Africa with a population of 600 million people was signed in Cairo recently. So we have one market. What remains to be done is for non-tariff barriers to be brought down. We need to see the free movement of goods, the free movement of capital, and the free movement of labor across this region. And that way you'll see an economic renaissance like never before. Now, going forward, what do I plan to do? I thought hard and long about this. I'd like to do a PhD. And I'd like to teach. I'd like to work on getting a good rental portfolio, which I'm on right now, so that I don't have to, you know, walk hand in ball when I'm an old man, especially because I'll have worked for the chamber for four years and earned no money for it. And I'd like to use, do my farming using the value chain approach that I talked to, talk to you. On the more fun side, I'd like to learn how to ride a horse and how to fly a plane. Well. Whether I'll achieve that or not, I'll try and I'll put my best foot forward as I always do. And I'm hoping that that will, be success, will, will also be achievable. I'm only 50, so I'm not really thinking of retiring that soon, but it's always good to have a, a medium to long-term plan. Now, in my life's journey, there are many things that I've learned. And I, I thought maybe I should share with you 10 thoughts that I learned, or things that I learned along the way, and things that probably will determine whether you are successful or whether you fail. The first one is it's never too early to start. It's never too early to start. I mean, get up. If you have a plan, you can start executing your plan today. And I always advise people against analysis paralysis. Don't analyze things for too long. Work hard and you work smart. Nothing ever beats working hard. I mean, nothing will replace the value and the benefit of working hard. I mean, at this, I mean to date, I, mean, I'm I, I have been very successful. My businesses do very well. But I think if you talk to the people that I work with, they will tell you that I do, I mean, I work bloody hard. And I encourage people, especially the young people, work as hard as you can. It will never, never not stand in your stead. The third thing that I encourage you to do is keep learning. Read, read, and read. If, you've done a, if you're studying for an undergraduate degree now, don't waste time, go straight for your, your master's, and keep learning, because learning, I mean, education, is the candle that's going to take this world away from poverty. Nelson Mandela said it, and he knew why he said it. Employees quit bosses, not jobs. Trust your instincts. The instinct is such a crucial thing. And as a man, I'll tell you one thing. Women have better instincts than us. Many times through my business career, I'm, I would meet with somebody, and my wife would tell me, be careful about that person, for no good reason. Maybe he was a guy in the room with the best jokes. He had a great, <laughs> he had a great sense of humor. Maybe he's the guy who had the best plan. But do trust your instincts. If you want to do a business deal, always spend time to listen to your instinct. And you see, life it works, moves at such a fast pace today that it's very difficult to actually find that moment of silence in your day to sit down and reflect and say, what does my instinct tell me about this situation or about this person? So I. I'm a great believer in trusting one's instincts. Align what you love with what you do. If you're in a job or you're doing a course that you don't like, my advice to you is get out of it and do what you like because people do better at the things that they like to do. And failure is a condiment that gives success its flavor. I talked about failure earlier on. And I look at the people who, who didn't want to talk to me in, 2000, in uh, 1997 because I had failed and I would lost money. And a lot of them today are busy trying to be my friends. So don't fear failure. It just teaches you one thing, one way of how not to do what you're doing. The next thing is capital, money. Capital is overrated. 
A lot of people use that as an excuse. They say, I can't get into business because I don't have the capital. Let me tell you guys, there's more money than you can think to chase a good idea. I think what you need to do is work on the concept, work on the idea. They're angel investors. Yeah? I'm sure Ali Khan has got some money. I have some money. If you've got a very good idea, I'll be very happy to listen to you. There's angel investor clubs. There are banks. There's always money to chase a good idea. Last week I had a meeting with uh, some young men who have a, an app that they're trying to sell. And it's an idea that they are perfecting and fine-tuning. And I'm putting in um, $300,000 into his business. Simply because it's an excellent idea. Where is this guy? He just left campus. He doesn't have two pairs of shoes. But he has an idea that I believe will create a fantastic business um, uh, solution. And be decisive. I talked about analysis paralysis. And my final lesson learned is find a wave and ride on it. The bus comes, stops at your stop, and goes. A lot of people don't become successful because they take too long making that decision. And in every epoch, in every era, there are opportunities that present themselves. I mean, today, what are the big challenges in Kenya? Look at the tra traffic situation. There must be a better way for us to move. If you look at how long we spend in the traffic, there must be a better way. I met a group of people recently who are planning to do an overhead tram from Jomo Kenyatta to the city. And I thought that was ingenious. You know Kenyans and land. If you try and create a train a network from the Jomo Kenyatta to, the, to town, I think you're going to have 100 court cases because of land. Everyone's going to say, this is my land. But who owns the land on top of you? <laughs> so these guys are planning an overhead tram that will be about 50 meters above the ground. I think it's been deployed somewhere in Latin America. And I said, amazing. Will people take it? And why not? I mean, if you're flown um, into the country and you've been flying at 35,000 feet above the ground, <coughs> what's the big deal about being 50 feet above the ground and getting to your destination? So essentially, I'm saying in every era, there's a new opportunity to be learned. Now, I'll close by sharing with you some thoughts. What is it that keeps me awake at night? What three things can I say keep me awake at night? The first one, and by far the most important, is the poverty that we have in our country. I really think that something's got to give at some point. I mean, our economy rose at 5 to 6% every year. A lot of wealth is being created in this country. But the question that I want to ask is, is that wealth finding its way into those who don't have anything? And I really think that we have a big problem because maybe the, leaders, the leadership needs to focus a lot more on policies of spreading the wealth that is being created. I think the world will never be a good place if we see the poverty that we still have in this country and what's being done about it. I mean, I, I really, for the life of me, have sleepless nights about what we can do to create a situation where we lift people from absolute poverty. If there was a way that that 5 or 6% can go to the bottom of the pyramid, I think we'd be a long way ahead. Insecurity keeps me awake at night because somewhere in this town, outside this town, there's somebody planning how they're going to kill more people. Why they do that, I don't understand it. it I, I'd, I'd be the wrong person. So of course, like you, it worries me that we live in a world that's increasingly insecure. One of the final bastions of security in the world was Europe. And I think for those of you who get to travel the world, you can attest to the fact that being in Europe was always, always relaxing. When you walk the streets of Geneva, or you walk the streets of Paris, you never ever thought that there was somebody waiting with some guns who was going to just mow down people. So insecurity today is being spread across the whole globe. And I'm just wondering, I mean, as I drove into the intercon this morning, I reflected on my days in the university, where all the hotels were open as they could be. You didn't go through any security screening. Those days a beer in the Serena was 20 bob, because all beers were price controlled. Huh? So I can tell you. The other thing that keeps me awake at night is 2017. If we look at what's going on in the country today, if we look at the pronouncements, if we, I don't know how many of you have seen the clip of what Moses Kuria, who is currently a guest of the state. Did you, any of you see that going around on YouTube? Yes. And there's a lot of similarity between what's going on now in, 20, in 2015 and what happened in 2005. 
So I'm just praying and hoping that our, that, that our leaders are going to see sanity to avert 207, I mean 2017, being another 207. We have two years to go, but I think a lot needs to be done to make sure that the rhetoric goes down, to make sure that people realize the dividend of peace. And those are the three things that I would say keep me awake at night. And um, that is the end of my presentation. <laughs> Let me... One of the things that I, I found um, I really enjoyed was, um, you know, and I think I have spent a lot of time serving for free. I, I told you and I mean it. I work for the chamber. I don't get a salary for it. I do it because I love my country. And I think one of the things that our society needs to do is to stop glorifying wealth. Money is, is important, but it's not everything. It's not everything. And um, I don't know how many of you have read Steve Jobs' last words. <coughs> and Steve Jobs said, I reached the pinnacle of success in the business world. In other words, in others, in other eyes, my life is an epitome of success. However, aside from work, I have little joy. In the end, wealth is only a fa the only fact of life that I'm accustomed to. He said, um, now I know when we have accumulated sufficient wealth to last our lifetime, we should pursue other matters that are unrelated to wealth. I'd like you to read what Steve Jobs said. We can contribute a lot by giving. Money is not the only thing that we must pursue. We can pursue greater things. We saw the Pope here last week. Wasn't he such a humble guy? I mean, compare the way the Pope travels and the way Professor Ward travels. <laughs> if we were to vote for them, I think I know who I'd vote for. <laughs> Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.